Hi, I'm Ralph Preston. Every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern, we have these Stroke Buddies Stroke Survivor Support Group meetings, and uh, we try and bring uh, to you different guests that can add um, perspective to uh, all of our recoveries. And today, we're really lucky to have Abby Simon with us, and Abby is a uh, SLP, speech and language pathologist, um, aphasia expert, and she's also a life health coach. Um, I met her in Tom Broussard's Aphasian Nation meeting um, at the, they only gave her a few minutes at the end, uh, but she impressed me and we had a couple of connections in North Carolina that maybe we'll get into. And I just thought uh, we don't have enough on aphasia in, in, um, in what I've been able to, to bring to people. So I wrote her right away. I think I wrote her about 10 minutes after the meeting was over and invited her to come. And so welcome, Abby. And I guess the first thing I'd ask you to do is just tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe even a little bit about how you became a speech and language pathologist. We're all kind of empathetic people. And I, I, I think that mostly there's some empathy involved in almost everybody's story as to how they ended up doing what they're doing. And I've been surprised a few times. So, uh, so if you just give us a little uh, background on yourself, that would start off. That would be great. Sure. Thanks so much for having me and asking me to talk to you guys today. I'm happy to be formal or informal. We'll get a vibe from what everybody wants to sort of talk about based on some of the topics that I've prepared. But please know that I'm not here to teach or lecture. I'm here to have a conversation with people who whether you identify as an empath or not, anybody that wants to make the world a better place and help people by sharing their knowledge is empathic. And some colleagues and I were talking yesterday, sometimes being an empathic person gets the best of us and we professionals who do it wind up ending our professional day and carrying the stories way too deep in our bodies that um, sometimes can take a toll on us as well. And um, that's why when I tell you a little bit about what I do, it makes sense that my motto is that when someone has a stroke, it does not just affect the person who has it. So as Ralph said, I, I am a speech pathologist. I've been practicing for about 26 years. And a few years ago, I really decided that my work with the others involved in a person's life who has acquired a communication struggle, that person who I identify as a care partner is often in need from some support as well, because it's their life that changes in an instant too. And whether we recognize that or not, I think it's vital that their needs and emotions are addressed, even as quickly as the person who had the stroke is discharged from a hospital. So I created, I went to health coaching school to become a certified health and wellness coach. And I knew right away, I was not going to do what a lot of my fellow students were doing, which was to help women or men lose weight, learn how to exercise and eat more green food. But I was going to create a program for care partners to make sure their self-care needs were met and that the feeling of burden and overwhelm could be really minimized. So by marrying those two things, being a specialist in acquired neurogenic communication disorders, right? How do people as we age have trouble communicating? And I don't know all of you. I don't know if you, got, if you all have a communication problem, if you've had a stroke or someone you know has, and we can share that in a minute, but you don't need to just have had a stroke in order to have a communication struggle, Okay. So that's a little bit about, I am, I heard Ralph say somebody here maybe is driving in Nyack. Is that possible? I was walking into my room. Oh, she's driving. You're driving in Nyack? Okay, so that's my old stomping ground. You can tell I'm not from North Carolina because I have a Northeastern accent. I'm from New York and moved here from uh, not too far from Nyack, so I'm envious at what you're seeing right now, Elizabeth. Perhaps I hope you're not driving over the bridge, but anyway, you're near some favorite <laughs> restaurants of mine. 
And um, I don't know if when you guys have a guest like me, you take turns talking about yourselves, but I'm going to give you that opportunity in a minute. I did prepare some slides for visuals, but raise your hand if you'd rather me just talk. Okay. Up, now, up to you. Raise your hand if you want me to show you some slides. <laughs> okay. Okay, Bruce is talking, but I can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself, Bruce, so I could hear what you said? There, I, I said it depends on what the slide show. Oh, <laughs> let me. That I should pick. I should pick a new um, deck now and really throw you guys for a loop. Um. So real quickly, uh, everybody here is a stroke survivor, and uh, I don't know. Um, Margo, I know Brian uh, has a, aphasia. I'm sure that I, Mike, did you get over it? Um, try to, I can't remember everything, but I, we have a couple people who have uh, communication disorders. And uh, I, I love what you said about uh, the other person and right away. Basically, your, your other person, your partner, your, is your support team, and they need to be supported like, right away i got sent home with the hospital with my wife who got 15 minutes on how to get it on and off the toilet and i was already doing it uh, nothing about shower chairs or anything you know our, our connection is um to north carolina is through triangle aphasia and carl mcintyre who suffered from aphasia and they made a movie some friends of mine actually 140 people were involved i knew 28 when i counted in the credits made a movie about <laughs> uh carl's story and journey and they turned him into a um, motivational speaker he was an actor so it was natural but it's not something you think about somebody with aphasia becoming a motivational speaker unless you know talk, dr tom broussard as well anyway uh there's a famous line in that movie that and then uh, that kind of connected me to abby because i went and looked at her website and found out about the care partners thing which happens to be the name of the rehab hospital i was in in Asheville, north carolina too another connection but the line i loved in that movie aphasia hope is a four-letter word i love hope is a four-letter word too is uh, what happens to one happens to two and they do a very dramatic setup to it with quiet and music right before it. So it's much more profound than when uh, I uh, just delivered it. So I think the I think the slides had it about three or four to zero. So if if you want to do that, I can share the yeah screen. and yeah sure. And I there's more slides than we'll need to cover, but I just want to point out that whether you are, and, and one of the slides I have talks about how people who have experienced a stroke identify. And as you know, if you go to different groups, some people say stroke survivor, some people say stroke warrior, some people say I had a stroke. Um, some people say, you know, I, I survived a stroke. So let's use the terms interchangeably and don't be offended if I don't refer to someone who has had a stroke the way you do. Does anybody have any questions for me before I show you a few slides? Just don't use the word victim. Good. Yes. I correct people 15 years later, so in a nice way, but you know, I think that if you think of yourself as a victim, you're more likely to be a victim. Totally, that's all about mindset and that's a big thing. So. I, I just put, I'm, I'm going to go fast. If you want me to slow down at any point, I will, because I want to just breeze through some things and then let us talk together about the topics that I think are really important. So this is just one of the things that Ralph just said is that um, the, the line from the movie, which was not the hope line, the other one you said. What happens to one, one happens, happens to two or right. three or five if you have three right. kids. And my way of saying that I becomes we, right? So what happened to me happens to us. And how I feel, oh, this whole set of words is gone. That's interesting. So, oh, caregiver, or as I like to say, care partner. And let me just stress, you've heard Ralph use the word care partner. I don't know if you all use that regularly, but I feel very strongly. If there's one thing we take from me talking to you today is that the word caregiver 
automatically implies by the meaning of the word give or the verb that one is giving of themselves and giving to somebody else. But when someone becomes a caregiver, whether by their choice, whether by the necessity, whether while they plan to or overnight, we must make sure that it is only part of who they are and part of what they do. So I really feel that care partnership is a relationship and I love to focus on that selfless and selfish balance. So we talked about who I am. I'm the speech pathologist and integrative health coach. We won't go through that. And I like to think about how we introduce ourselves, right? I can be so many different people. I could be these people that I listed. I'm someone's wife, I'm someone's mom, I'm someone's speech therapist, I'm someone's health coach. Um, and I like to talk about how people identify and if your identity changed, um, where's that other little piece? Hold on. Sorry, I went too quick. Um, there should have been something here that says, not only are we the person we label ourselves in terms of a relationship, but we are people who like doing things. I like to vacuum my house every other day. I'm a person who likes to do yoga at night. I'm a person who loves to cook, but I don't use white flour. That's part of my identity. Not only am I a family member and friend and professional, but my identity goes along with the hobbies and the interests I have as well. And I hope that you all feel like you can preserve some of that identity, even if you have to do it in a different way than you did before the stroke. I always tell people to try and take up their old hobby. And if they can't, uh, due to physical limitations, find a new one. Or and modify the way you do it. There's, right. You can't, right? Like, there's got to be an adaptation. Right. So that word, I, that yeah. word identity um, is, you know, really thinking about who you identify or what your identity is. And how has it changed since your stroke or a stroke affected your life? Um, and see, I did put the word victim at the end here because I hate it also. And so I should have made the font really small, but I, I hope that people don't associate it as that word. Um, so I mentioned before the reason I use the word care partner. And if you look at this, you know, giving of yourself can be draining. Giving of yourself can be costly. If again, we identify as a caregiver, giving of yourself can be stressful, and part of your role, if you are a care partner, is to receive, right? We have to give and we have to take. So that's something really hard for care partners to do. Oh, that's where it is. So you can also be one of these things. I'm an animal lover. I'm a triathlete. I'm a friend, a spouse, et cetera. We're not just someone who was ex impacted or experienced a stroke. All right. So... Ralph said that I specialize in working with people who have aphasia, and I do. And um, he mentioned just a couple of you here may have experienced some kind of aphasia. But when people get older, whether or not they've had a stroke, communication can become challenging. We might have those senior moments. We may feel like our memory is a little bit unpredictable and reliable. Some people get diagnosable memory issues. Some people have neurological issues or hearing and vision changes. But we're here together because the illness, the diagnosis that brings you as a group together is the stroke. And so how does a speech therapist work in to someone's life who had a stroke? Maybe some of you have experienced or know someone that has experienced any of these things, whoops, which have to do with swallowing, right? So strokes, as you know, could happen on any part of the brain. And depending on where the stroke occurred, different symptoms present, whether they're physical, whether they're um, verbal, or whether they're mo motoric in terms of swallowing, speaking, your motor speech, how clearly you speak. It, it could affect your voice depending on what cranial nerve was affected, if any, and it could affect your language. And that where that's where aphasia comes into play because language is composed of these four domains how we speak or express ourselves, how we understand and comprehend, how we read and how people write. So when one of these domains is affected, a speech pathologist can certainly help a person improve these parts of their communication. 
And the most important thing is when and if you need a speech pathologist, that the goals in your therapy completely target what you need from them. If you need to learn how to use speech to text on a phone or a device, that's what the goal should be about. If you want to be someone who is improving their reading, that's what the goal should be about. And re-engaging or re-establishing ways to do activities that matter to you before your stroke. And granted, it might not be easy. I'm a realist. It's not easy for someone to golf again if their right or left arm has been paralyzed or weak. So I'm not glorifying and saying, oh, you have to still do everything you once did, but you, we can find ways to still get enjoyment from activities, even if you're not doing them the same way. And a speech pathologist should definitely focus on achieving successful ways for people to converse and communicate, even if it requires different modes of communication, writing, gesturing, pointing, et cetera. The most important thing I hope you all address at different points of your stroke recovery is staying connected socially. Yes, sir. Um, I have a friend, just briefly, I have a friend who um, is playing golf one-handed uh, while he's working on getting his second uh, hand uh, back on the club. He's just start get starting to get that second hand able to grip and dealing with the fact that it doesn't really remember how to do the swing and everything. But in the meantime, the last five years, he's been golfing one-handed. So, you know. And there's wonderful adaptive clinics. I don't know where he lives, but wherever you live, there are adaptive sports you know, offices and clinics and organizations that can provide a lot of sports equipment that have some modifications to them. The other thing real quickly is, have you had any uh, luck uh, training voice to text with people with um, speech disorders? I have a friend uh, who I've been trying to encourage. It's very slow for her to type to uh, to um, try voice to text and she's reluctant because she has Dysarthria. Right. So so speech to text, it's like when we use a microphone. If you have dysarthria or if you have a really, really breathy voice, a microphone is only going to amplify the way you're speaking and sounding here. So if somebody is using voice or speech to text and their speech is not intelligible or if they have an accent, actually, and the, the, rec the software recognition isn't good enough, it will not transcribe it well. So that is very challenging and frustrating if someone is trying to do speech to text and their speech is not reliable. I found that mine, um, uh, AI on my iPhone has gotten a lot better. It's learned um, spellings of, uh, after Dr. Hetzler, Bruce Hetzler presented um, on spasticity and neuroplasticity. <laughs> I had to train it how to spell them and, you know, that I didn't want neuro and plasticity being two words and everything. Yeah, it's and amazing got, how it learns. I got onto it because a friend of mine who has had a stroke was German, but he lost his German accent. But when he had a stroke, he got a thick German accent that he can't get rid of, which is interesting. And he's a real uh, technology guy. And he six, seven years ago, he was talking to his iPad and I said, does it recognize you? And he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> it says it took a little while to train it, but it's good now. Well, you make a really good point. When someone has a stroke, if it has affected the language part of their brain, which for most people is on the left, and you are bi or trilingual, typically your primary language, right, the language you learned first and or use the most is the language that resurfaces quickest. So it's interesting that that guy's German came back before maybe his American uh, accent did. You have no idea how happy that makes me because for over 10 years, um, I met him 12 or 13 years ago. And for over 10 years, I've been saying, I think what happened, because this happened to me, I was uh, doing a video on dealing cards and I reconnected with a big chunk of like uh, pushing the cards out. All of a sudden I could just like do it. It's like I connected to a block. And I, I've been saying for 10 years, I think he connected to the six-year-old boy in his brain, <laughs> the six-year-old language you know, yeah. boy, his brain, you just kind of said the same thing. 
Yeah, the, the brain is unbelievable. And I love that you mentioned, and I'm sure this group has talked about neuroplasticity before, but the reason a speech pathologist can make such an impact on an adult brain that we think has matured and grown to its capability is because of what we know as neuroplasticity. So we all know, I hope in this group, that your brain can change until you're no longer living. Whether it's little change or big change, no matter how much time has passed since your stroke, or even without a stroke, our brain can recruit new parts of it to learn new things. So that, so care partner is one of the things I want you to take from this. Neuroplasticity and the brain's power to change. If you believe in it and you try, it's not going to happen passively. And then you'll just get to this. We'll get to the other little piece about the coaching. So, so far, does anybody have a question about age-related or acquired communication disorders that could happen with an adult, whether or not you've had a stroke. Anybody? I Brian, all I, Brian, all I could focus on is that sky, and I need to know if it's a photo or a real fake background. I mean, I know it's not real, that you're not sitting outside right now, but did you take that picture? Unmute yourself so I can find out where it is. <laughs> you don't mind. Hey, find out where and yes, it is real. I took it out here in Palmdale, California. It's amazing. The colors are amazing. Every once in a while, the smog has good results. <laughs> is it always that? It looks so purple. Um, it is. It's cloudy, yep. Yeah. Okay. Bruce, were you going to say something? I, I had a Thanks, Brian. question. As a speech pathologist, you probably deal with several types of aphasia. Most of the literature I've read, I'm not a pathologist. I, I've got a PhD. I'm the sort of doctor that doesn't help anybody. Ah. <laughs> but uh, what is it? It is in botany. What's the doctorate in? Neurobiology. <laughs> Uh, neurobiology? Yes. Yeah, but that doesn't help anybody, does it? Oh, not at all. No. Oh, by the way, I do have a link to North Carolina. I spent a year working for the neurophysiology branch of the neurotoxicology division of the Environmental Protection Agency in a laboratory in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Hmm. Not too far. Oh, I lived in Raleigh at the time. So that, yeah, so that's so interesting. So you were going to say that speech pathologists see lots of different types of aphasia, and that yeah. is true. And the only things I've read about are treatment of Broca's aphasia. And I was wondering, have you had experience or do you know how to treat someone with alexia with agraphia resulting from damage to the angular gyrus? I love talking your language. <laughs> I, can, I can nerd out too, Bruce. <laughs> um, yes. So aphasia comes in many forms, again, depending on where the stroke or other type of brain injury occurred. You don't need to have had a stroke to have aphasia, right? You could have a brain tumor. You could have had a, another kind of trauma, other kind of disease. Um, but indeed there are certain types of severities and labels of aphasia that might be more challenging to treat depending on one's comprehension and insight and awareness to what we are targeting. So again, it comes down to a skilled speech therapist knowing what's important to that person and their what strengths that they have and a little bit of their impairment. So let me just say, since we're talking speech, a speech therapist is either going to address impairments and try to restore them Okay, what cannot be achieved right now? And how can we recruit other ways in the brain to re-establish the skill that was lost? Or can we use a compensatory mechanism and compensate for what was lost and just achieve it in a different way? And so when someone has a Broca's aphasia, typically their comprehension is really strong. When someone has a fluent or other type of aphasia, sometimes called a Wernicke's, and there's other different types, and their comprehension is not as strong, it might be a little bit more challenging to explain to the person why we're doing and what we're doing. But again, it comes with just a little skill and finesse. 
But alexia and agraphia, which Bruce mentioned, are impairments that re um, relate to reading and writing. Okay. All right. Let's go back to my little presentation. All right. So we again, getting back to the focus on social connectedness. So important. And this group is a perfect example of how people stay connected. And so in addition to social and um, physical well-being, there's also emotional health. And you all, when we started talking before we hit record, people were talking about um, acceptance and the ability to move on and have hope. And what I always have to remind myself is that a lot of the people I see who have had strokes are the ones who can cope, are the ones who are resilient. And I can't help but think about people who aren't facing the reality and they're feeling more depressed and they're feeling less hopeful and maybe not engaging. So I commend the people that show up and know they're resilient. And I also hope that the other people can be influenced by people like us and know that there's always ways to bounce back. There's always hope for the future. Right. Let's not talk so much about aphasia. I just, I just hope that because aphasia is so not known by over 80% of people that you realize that there are more than 2 million people with aphasia in just the United States. And I don't know how many people I'm looking at, but 25, it's a little vague, but between 25 and 40% of people who've had, oh, look at that word. <laughs> tis, 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 tis. 25 to 40 percent of people who have had a stroke do get aphasia okay and again we know that aphasia doesn't affect intelligence and i talked about neuroplasticity so let's just move on from this let's just wait let's just move on how can i go through this slide? okay so this is when i becomes we someone had a stroke but more than one person is affected and this is when I put my health coaching hat on and say, I need to address the dynamics between the person who had the stroke and the people in their life. Marilyn, do you want to read this, um, the words in black up at the top, this bolded sentence? Or read the orange first, strokes? I've asked Marilyn. her to unmute. Marilyn, do you want to, I just like someone else oh. to read this out loud. Go ahead, okay. Marilyn. Strokes do not impact the person who had it. Do not Everyone. just impact the person, right? Yes. Just. Okay, keep going. Everyone. Everyone in that person's life experienced a sudden life change. Right. And so then, yeah. go ahead, keep going. Initial attention and focus on the patient. What about the care partners? Do they receive a prescription when they leave the hospital? Where did the casseroles go? Do people continue to show up weeks after, weeks and months after the stroke? Right. So, and we, we've all been there, whether you're the one showing up with the casserole or offering a ride or offering to do an errand for somebody, it always happens like right away, right? Oh my God, we're getting so much attention. People are here to help us. It's amazing how much help people offer in the beginning stages of whether it's a hip surgery or a stroke. And then that time fades. It's like, uh, hello, I still need it. I still want it. And care partners begin to say no. No, I got this. This is what I'm meant to do. This is till death do us part. This is my blood relative. I'm the only friend they have. I got it. And care partners learn to say no. But you know what? We need to learn to say yes. And not only do we need to learn to say yes, we need to ask for help. Because if care partners don't, they won't get it. And so often, maybe some of you know, the care there's guilt. Oh, I don't want to bother somebody else. And that feeling of guilt winds up being unhealthy for not only the person saying no, thinking they're the martyr and can do it by themselves, but then the person receiving the care is also affected by that person's unwillingness to get help from somebody else. So um, 
let's see. So I, when I work with clients, I say, okay, here's the person that had the stroke. And now all the other people in your name, I call it a little neighborhood, whether it's a church, a temple, a barber, a bakery, your work, your neighbors, everyone that's connected to you is affected by the stroke. And a big thing I push, and we'll, we can talk about this in a minute when we go over some questions. Someone has a stroke, stroke survivor. You go to the hospital, you go to a doctor, you're in a clinic, and they talk about these things. You have to change your life. You have high cholesterol. You can't eat any more saturated fat. Maybe you're going to experience some depression. Oh, you need rehab. You need to go to an outpatient program. Yep. Okay. All, and they give you all these papers and all these pamphlets and all this information. You're like, oh my God, I'm never going to do this. There's no way I'm giving up ice cream. There's no way I'm going to start exercising, even if I have like two working legs. Like, no way. No, thank you. And I get that. And that's totally real. But what I also get is that when you, the person, leaves the hospital, medical professionals, therapists don't talk about these relationships. It could be with the beautician or the barber. They don't talk about how the relationships in your life and how the care partners in your life need to step up and what these changes are going to do to them. And I'm not trying to make a stroke survivor feel guilty or pressure. I'm trying to be realistic that we can't expect all the attention to just focus on the stroke survivor. All right, so then Abby Simon's like, okay, I'm gonna do health and wellness coaching. And I'm gonna let people know that, let me tell you this, health does not mean you just eat a nutritious diet. There's so much more to health than eating vegetables. And that doesn't mean I think you shouldn't eat vegetables. And it doesn't mean that I didn't learn the vegetables that are really important for neuroproactive health, right? That we all know the different creatines and glutamines and kale and all the B vitamins and all this healthy fats that we could consume, the fish oils. I could list that on and on in pages. And it's true. The food on our plate is important. But the food, the nourishment off the plate that has to do with these parts of this circle that I just showed you here, the environment of your home, whether you have home cooked meals, whether you're interested in finances, these parts of our life, oh, the P is missing here. Um, these parts of our life also contribute to health. Okay. And when someone feels off balance and that something's lacking in their life and they feel unhealthy, maybe they just need a little bit of spirituality. Maybe they need to find a way to be creative or be exposed to something creative because that has an um, impact on the brain. Just like the food we swallow, these engagements in life also impact the brain. We're um, working on, oh, sorry. We're working on many of those as we can. We actually have a um, nutrition after stroke group that's um, championed by a, uh, she's not a stroke survivor, but we have a number of stroke survivors sharing how they're eating more healthy and recipes and, and things like that. But we actually have a champion in that group that is a functional nutrition chef. Oh, I want to meet them. Oh, we, we, I'll send you an invite to join the group. Uh, um, she posts every day um, um, meal uh, options. Um, she's given two presentations to us, one on the um, uh, effects of sugar and other inflammatory things. And then she did came back and did the counterpoint to that, which was um, healthy foods that don't cause inflammation. Well, they're, they're kind of mixed up, but they have overarching themes of those two. We also have a wellness after stroke group that's championed by Angelina. I thought I saw her earlier, but that might've been yesterday. Um, and uh, we do a breathing class every every Friday there. And we've had um, Dr. Schwartfeger uh, do presentations on wellness um, and uh, what else, mindfulness. So with all, so that means you all meet, I guess, frequently during the week, correct? Is that what you're implying? Well, you meet? we, um, they're, they're actually, they're Facebook groups. We have, okay. um, 
we have three meetings a week now. Um, this one, which is mostly science and recovery based. And then on Thursday, we're now doing the uh, Am I OK? The, um, the, you know, dealing with the um, mental str uh, struggles and aspects post stroke. And then Friday, we have a breath and meditation class. It's about a half an hour. And we record that and put it up for other people. So we learn different breaths. and. Yeah. Every That's week. Good. And let me just get a sense. I know some people don't have their cameras on, but um, since stroke happened in your life, have you made obvious diet or physical changes? Have, and don't you can close your eyes if you don't want anyone to see your answer. But have you made changes, or are you still doing what you always did, and you're fine with it? Anyone want to speak up about that? Margo, you're not. You're shaking your head. What What are you shaking your head about? No, I, I de I've definitely uh, cut out all the sugar. Um, I'm a sugar, sugar addict. I love it. <laughs> um, so since that, um, that and, you know, just low sodium. And I really try to watch, you know, the amount of like carbs and things like that and processed foods. Um, do, you feel feel like, like, do, you, do you feel deprived? No. Not, not at, at first. Yeah. But now I'm not, I'm, I'm used to it, but I think that the, uh, in, 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 in the swelling, I guess in my brain or whatever, um, was, um, I would have more headaches when I eat bad, bad. Um, so, you know, good motivation. Is, Yes. <laughs> yeah. Here's the word you were trying to say. Yes. Thank you. Inflammation. There you go. Yeah. Anybody else make any drastic or even little changes? I made it. Oh, go ahead, Bruce. Oh, well, thanks to my wife, we virtually cut sodium completely out of our diets. And because my blood pressure is very sodium sensitive. So uh, I think that has helped a lot. Okay. Mike, what about you? Yeah, I've cut out, um, I, I rarely use salt on anything, everything. Like if I buy any, um, you know, canned, canned vegetables or anything, you know, it's all the no salt added. Um, and yeah, you know, I rarely eat red meat once in a while, have a hamburger. Um, you know, it's kind of my splurge. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, just just little things. Um, don't eat out as much. So, yeah, I mean, I I hate when people think about depriving themselves. Like, I have a client I work with who had a stroke, and she's so afraid of having anything indulgent. She describes as sweet. She doesn't eat anything sweet. But then she tells me for breakfast she has two pieces of white bread toast with butter, and I'm like, okay, like that's great. But it's probably just as bad, if not worse, than a little bit of apple pie with, you know, made without too much Crisco. So it, it's finding out what works for you and not feeling like you de you're depriving yourself. But let's just finish this last little bit so that, I mean, I don't really have to. It's it's the rest of what I was going to talk about seems like something you cover in your other groups, which acknowledges that recovery or readjustment and re-engagement into life after stroke isn't just about dietary changes, isn't just about strengthening your muscles, and isn't just about um, making sure you take a lot of medicine. It's about maintaining relationships and recognizing how the stroke could affect your overall health and wellness, and wellness has to do with relationships in your life. And when I coach people, I'm not a mental health therapist, so we're not necessarily going back in your, your life and saying, let's dig back to your roots and discover why you are the way you are. Coaching comes from the point of what's the problem right now? And in six weeks, we're going to go from the problem to the solution, and I'm going to hold your hand a little bit to do that because sometimes people just need to be held accountable. So it's just good for me to remind people that it's okay to ask for help and know that you won't always need it and that there's no shame involved in admitting when something needs to be improved. 
So let's just forget the rest. Of, let me just see what the rest of the slides just show. If you want to fly through it, it's something that, um, that you know, we all um, struggle yeah. with. I mean, so let me just get a sense of um, how many people here live with someone or have someone in their life that they consider a care partner or someone that helps you and that provides you with care. Anybody? All right. So, Bruce, you mentioned your wife. Yes. Brian, Brian no, no. someone helps you. Mar Margo, raise her hand. Margo. Mike, aren't you married? Okay. Well, and I mean, you could be married and and not have a care partner. Because <laughs> one thing I didn't get to interject a while are back. Are they? Was, are any of those people in ear distance from you now? Are you? Are you all sort of alone, Billy? I haven't heard a word from you, Billy. Who are you? <laughs> oh yeah. Hi, Bill. I, I I live alone. Um, my wife passed away. My daughter passed away. So it's just me. And I, I like to go to Panera, basically. What I found with the stroke is a lot of water is good for you. Yes. It's basically, a, a good attitude, a good positive attitude, and to have a lot of patience. When you have patience, you go places. If you lose your patience, you're all done. Do you have people in your life that you interact with during the week? No. You, you, no. But no, was, no not, not really, no. Oh, you got your grandson. I, yeah, but then, you know, not, you know, not every day, right. Yeah, I said during I, the week, I, I, like, that you get out and you see people and that other oh, yeah. people. I go I go to the store every day and do my walking. Okay. But he also yeah. attends everything we do, and we made him our resident philosopher a long time ago when he came up with a line where he said, well, otherwise you could just go ahead and drop dead. That's an alternative. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. but not one that most people want. And it made his point, you know, like the other alternative is a lot. And I've never been in a meeting with Billy where he hadn't, where he made it this far without talking. Oh, my God, <laughs> Billy. You've been very interested. I've been listening to you. All right. Well, I'm glad I picked picked on you then. That's no, good. No, you haven't you're picked on Winnie good. yet. I'm about to pick on Winnie, Ralph. You think I'm not going to pick on Winnie? <laughs> Winnie got the kudos at the beginning of this. <laughs> Winnie, where do you live? I live in LA. <laughs> oh, near Brian? Yes. So you guys wake up early for this. Yes. Wow, that's devotion. 8 a.m.? No, Winnie gets up at 5.45 for my sister-in-law's Sunday morning adaptive yoga class, which I forgot to mention. We also have a yoga uh, class. So maybe you guys could be some inspiration for other people that need a little. Um, so this is, yeah, that's, it's good to that's know. What we're trying to do, but we, you know, it's hard to attract people. Um, I post this in lots of groups. We had, you know, 10, 20 people. Here's the thing. What happened was I started uh, editing these and putting them up the next day on my YouTube channel. As soon as you do that, people go, well, I can just watch it whenever I want. And I don't have to wait for you know, like two weeks for it to come out if I'm interested in it because I do it in a timely way. And so we've had, uh, you know, part of why the reason we're doing this is for the YouTube audience. Um, we've got um, on the talk videos, I think Dr. Hetzler is in the lead with um, one he did on uh, neuroplasticity that has about 1400 views. Is, so that's is that a lot suggesting this group is competitive? competitive you just said well i think so and so is in the lead with so many oh views. no no i just met the number of that's views. a good way to increase our stress ralph <laughs> just just to, so, the point is so, okay how about this some of the videos <laughs> have as many as 1400 views wow so you know we have to consider all those people i have been helping stroke survivors for about uh 13 years and you have no idea how, who you're helping or when. You just have to blast it out there. Uh, every week, two or three times, I get somebody, who, I go, who is this? I never heard of them. And they're like thanking me or saying something yeah. like, I really enjoyed uh, Abby's presentation, that kind of thing. They come out of the blue. So we just keep Mark. Trying. Mark just came back from being outside, maybe walking his dog or something. No, I was taking my kids to the bus stop. <laughs> that Hi, is everybody. so <laughs> much more important. Which means uh, you, yeah. must, so then you're not on the East Coast either if your kids are just getting. No, I'm on the West Coast. 
I'm in uh, Seattle, actually. Oh. And what's and something I'm you will... I'm, I'm hoping to to contribute more. I this is a horrible time, and I'm on my way to, of course, speech. <laughs> oh, so I was just going to ask you, what's something you're going to do for yourself today? Um, after I have speech and I have some physical therapy, uh, I'm doing yoga. Okay, yoga is yoga is a big part of my life. It was before my stroke. It's been after my stroke. I'm. I, I have a lot of you know mental issues as we we all do, and so a lot of emotional ones. Um. But physically, I'm still I'm, I'm a little weaker than I was before I started. But for the most part, I'm getting back on track. Nice. I love that attitude. Of course, I could ask you 5,000 questions about speech but I <laughs> because we're going to finish me talking about how the stroke or whatever diagnosis you feel needs most attention affects you and other people. And that health isn't just about what we were talking relating to food. Um, it's, it sounds really easy when someone like me tells you to focus on your breath or take 10 minutes every day and look at the sun or read something either silently out or out loud every day. It's so easy to hear those suggestions. It's so easy not to. It's so easy to just do what comes naturally, what's familiar and available. When where any of us are asked to go out of our way, I shouldn't say any. There's so many people that are ambitious and they'll do whatever someone else tells them. But when you're in a routine, regardless of how much time it's been since your stroke, it's really easy to be complacent. And going back to that neuroplasticity, everything can grow, right? The brain is in charge of our thoughts. Our thoughts control the way we feel and our feelings influence our actions. And someone mentioned in the beginning, you know, reframing and retraining our mind and what I call mindset tasks, right? I'm sure you've had people come and talk to you about a positive or a growth mindset and versus a fixed mindset. And again, it could sound woo-woo. And I believe that it did. And when someone told me years ago that I should try meditation, and as you could tell, I've got a lot of energy. I'm pretty type A in many ways. I utterly laughed. I was like, you think I am going to be quiet for even a minute and do meditation? Let me tell you, there's not a night I go to sleep without selecting something from one of my apps that I could either listen to someone's voice or just music that puts me in such a state of ease and I've succumbed that I feel without it, I'm different. So we have to be open to doing something that we're uncomfortable with. Because one of the things I tell people is that without a challenge, there won't be a change. And so I can challenge you to eat green food every night. And I can challenge you to be more communicative about your needs. And I can challenge you to ask the people you live with that are affected by your lifestyle changes and to say to them, how are you doing, right? So let, I want to end with that about the my 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 firm belief in the care partner's needs, um, and that while you all get a lot of attention um, because you were the quote unquote person that had the stroke, I like to remind people that if someone's providing self care, or when we when we need care for ourselves, it doesn't mean that the person is selfish. And then it's okay for you to say to your wife, your kid, your friend, your neighbor, let me know how your needs are being met. You're so great with attending to mine. We care so much about me not having salt in my diet, but do you miss salt? And if you miss salt, what's something we can do to get you to have that in your diet while I don't have it in mine? And, and let's see, let's see what else. Um, oh, there's all these different ways. So I like to think about what we can control. So many things in life are out of our control, but you know you can control your sleep. You know you can control your mind, thoughts. You know you can control your physical activity. There's the, we have to think about what we can control and influence. And so I hope with my little summary of how I help people with their communication and achieving communication success, for your own needs, as well as communication with your care partner and how important that is not to neglect and to actually maybe even address more than you have, in addition to knowing and repeating what you already know, that health is more than just the food on your plate.
And that when people like me are empaths and want to just help others, it's a community of resources that we should be able to share with one another and, and learn from. So if there's any feedback that you want to give me right now or questions you want to ask me or each other, I think we could use the last few minutes to do that if that's okay with you. Um, so feel free to ask me something, question something I said, or ask me something more that I haven't mentioned. Let me know what you all have on your minds. Sir. One thing I didn't, I never made clear is I don't know what your schedule is but we are um we don't have any kind of time limit set oh, that's session. what happened with me yeah. and Tom I, I thought know, we went so for an I, hour I, I sent you rushing and I'm not suggesting it but Julie went two hours and seven minutes last week so Oh, um, was competitive, Mike. no it's not competitive minds I'm just I'm giving you <laughs> I'm just telling you that um you know <laughs> I don't know what your schedule is. Yeah. You could have a 12 o'clock meeting or know, me just you eat lunch before 1230 or whatever, but uh, <laughs> we don't have a deadline. So Okay. Well, so I, let me see. <laughs> I'll just multitask while you guys think of anything that's on your mind to share with, you don't have to share it with me, share it with each other. I mean, I know you know each other well, but I'm happy to hear you um, share with each other or ask me questions. I got one. You were talking about, you know, the, in the whole care partner um, thing. One of the things that we see in the Facebook groups is there are a lot of really unsupportive families. Let's just put it, let's just leave it at that. I've actually seen people who go out of their way to be ugly and mean to to their relatives, mm. to their loved ones. Yeah, other people here can tell you, but I don't want to focus on that. What I really want to do is you know, a lot of times family's not supportive. How do you engage them to be a, you know, a care partner? And the other thing is, you know, a lot of times with friends and 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 people who are who are ancillary to the whole situation, especially if you have like, uh, if if you don't have big time uh, hemiparesis or uh, one side deficits, you know, you you basically have an illness that's invisible to them. And the other thing is most, a lot of people seem to think like a stroke is like the flu, like, you, you know, you should get over it in six weeks or, or six months or something. You know, I, I see comments like from family members, well, you know, you've been doing this for a year and a half. It's, you know, how come you're not better? It just, mm -hmm. so maybe the care, maybe the person that's impacted should do some uh, peer partner education and advocacy. So I think it's about advocate. Mike, Brian, did you raise your hand or was that just, Oh, one yeah. sec. Um, it's about advocating and I think admitting, right? So it comes down to how do we feel comfortable and find the proper way to tell someone what our needs are. And in those groups that we see on Facebook, when we're hearing and reading the ranting, some caregivers, care partners will say, I can't believe how little I'm respected. I can't believe all I do is try to do these things and no one pays attention to my suggestion. I'm so sick of it. I'm so sick of it. I'm like, I get it. Don't be a whiner. <laughs> well, don't be a whiner, but they might really be sick of it, right? So that feeling of frustration and, and being fed up is valid. I think it's all about care. If you have a lot of care in you, you'll move forward. People will help you. But with the people that don't care, they have a problem already. They will never, they will never see the light of day. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. I, what do you, could you, uh, I think I know what you mean, Billy, but uh, to find a little bit what you, or elaborate. They don't care, what you mean they, don't care they never will. You know, sometimes when you say somebody, how do you feel today? And, and they, they say, okay. But they were saying, I don't feel good. You you wouldn't even you wouldn't even analyze. You say, Oh, okay, have a good day. You they, they don't even listen half the time, people. They, they, they just know, oh, how you feel today? Oh, I feel great. Oh, that's great then. But if you say, I don't feel great, I feel terrible, they'll still say, Oh, that's great. Right. That's that's, I don't know if you heard me in the beginning when I like to say to people, how are you really? Like, tell, don't just say, okay. Like, yeah. think about it for 10 long seconds. Right, Brian, what were you going to say? But you're, you're a rare person. 
You see, no. you, you know, what is the percentage out there of people that don't care? That's the problem. Mm -hmm. They don't, so it's a pretty large percentage, I think. I was going to say, listening is probably the most important communication skill in any type of relationship, any type of relationship. Very well said. From, from casual okay. right up to life partner. And that's called caring. If you listen and you I, I analyze it, okay. that, that's what, that, that's caring, basically. I, wait, Marilyn, were you going to say something? No. Oh, no. Did you have a stroke, Marilyn? Oh, yes, yeah. I did. Three, I'm three years post-stroke. And how would you say your life has changed the most since your stroke? Oh, it's changed quite a bit. I think I got a little alphagia. I don't know which way is up sometimes. And, and I just get along the best I can, you know, but I keep keep pushing forward. I keep pushing forward. Okay. I can do, I can do everything I did before, but it's just challenging. And, and I walk around, I limp and I this and I that, but I keep pushing forward. And you put those necklaces on and no one would know you had a stroke, huh? Yeah. <laughs> what about Simone? I don't know if you can hear us, Simone. Your microphone is off. Yeah, I can hear you. How are you doing? I'm okay. Did I pronounce your name right? You did. Where do you live and why is your camera off? I live in New York, New Hampshire. Uh huh. Do you want to? Um, do you do you typically keep your camera off? Yeah, my face is a little crooked. Because you don't look good. My face is crooked. Okay. Well, I don't mean to make you uncomfortable, but I hope that you know the people in this group would never. That's another thing, right? Where we have to put our judgment aside and respect that if someone isn't comfortable, regardless of how we might present a situation, we've got to respect that. So Simone, thank you for answering my question and being honest. And thank you for not for asking her to turn on her camera. <laughs> no. <laughs> that and was Bri the point. <laughs> Brian, what were you gonna say? I don't mean to have forgotten. Just, um that um one thing i don't have um, a page but this arthria but this is actually help but i uh, was say one thing that kind of irritates me at least with my brother who is my main caregiver is he doesn't understand that being some things I'm just fine, but in other cases, um, I may not be able to do that thing. Mm -hmm. And when you're not able to, how does your brother react? Does he get Bas mad, frustrated, or accepting? Basically. He just gets upset because I may have been able to do that thing earlier that day. Mm -hmm. Who's older, you or your brother? Actually, me. Boss him around. <laughs> what? That won't work. Why not? Because, um, as I call him, he's my little big brother. Because he's five years younger, but six inches taller. Oh. <laughs> Do you live with him? Yep. Is it just the two of you? Right now, I guess. That's pretty cool. What's funny though, um, whenever he gets a girl that he's dating, he tells them right off the get go that. Basically, he's a package deal with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, so should... he, he kind of runs through girlfriends really quickly. Oh, or he could say to the girlfriends, I'm a package deal. And if you have a package to bring, that would be good too. 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> Brian, are you, you still in speech therapy? What? Are you still oh. in? No. Or, uh, Abby could tell you more about this. I, I'm not a, a SLP or any more of a speech coach than uh, I guess I'm probably a better physical coach than speech, but I've worked with two people like long term with dysarthria. And one of the things that you can that they have you do uh, typically is not being able to um, pass air over the vocal cords, I believe. Yep. No, and Abby's shaking her head. No. <laughs> Anyhow, there's a bunch of different uh, exercises that you can do, um, like uh, under the direction of physical therapists, I had somebody and she couldn't make H's, so we had her huff. And there, I found a website that's got a whole bunch of different things that uh, give you language that help promote some of the deficits that you have um, having dysarthria. Uh, maybe you know more yeah. a, about it, Abby, than well, I do. What? What's the way we improve anything? Practice, practice, practice. The same right. way you get to Carnegie Hall. Right, right. So if you want to improve cooking, you cook. If you want to improve talking, you talk. And I could be a speech therapist and 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 comment on what Ralph said. Dysarthria is when there's muscle weakness and in or incoordination of the muscles that have been impaired. And those muscles can indeed include the, the the diaphragm, the breathing muscles, which Ralph was saying, like, how does the air flow up and through our vocal cords? So that's one part of speech production. But then we have these mouth, or these articulators in our mouth that if there is weakness in those muscles, it makes it hard to be in very intelligible. And, you know, just listening to you, Brian, there is some coordination going on with your breathing that makes it hard for you to speak a long sentence. But we're not going to do speech therapy now. I'm restraining it, but appreciating that I recognize it's effortful for you at times to get your words out. But how wonderful it is to be in a group where no one's being like answering your questions for you or trying to rush you along or put words into your mouth. Right. If you needed help, hopefully you'd say, oh. I can't say that word. Uh, One, uh, I'll, I'll, go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. I will say um, the whole practice thing is I I have a YouTube channel. You do? I practice words and will on occasion go back and see if I've made any progress. You should also do some singing. Do you like to sing? Yeah. Tried it once hmm. and it did not work out very well. Oh. <laughs> Karaoke night. <laughs> Winnie, Winnie, I have not heard any. Well, you said you're from California. Who do you live with, Winnie? I live alone. Uh huh. And what's the hardest thing you face each day about living alone and having had a stroke? I don't worry about living alone. I kind of like living alone. And I I find all the things I want to do. So like in the morning, I, if I don't have Zoom, I normally outside walking. for a mile. I'm trying to walk a mile and a half. And for this year, I'm going to walk two miles. That's my goal. But when I make it or not is another story. Oh, you'll make it. Okay. <laughs> I know you'll make it. Okay. You're at a mile and a half, you work hard. I've watched the videos of your walk and you'll make it. What are you going to have for, well, it's, did you have breakfast yet? Yes. What did you have? Um, I had avocado, toast, tea, um, oranges, grapes. That's more than enough. Yeah, that's a pretty good breakfast. All right, I will have to go in a couple of minutes, but Frank, I haven't heard your voice. Yeah, he, uh, I think he was taking his son to. That's well, Frank. Frank is maybe not. Uh, Some people to yeah. Um, I have the thing I have is a little bit of this idea. Also, um, I have I have multiple things physical. Uh, Physical, motor, fine motor, speech, 
different things that affect me. So I have a big list of things I try to do every day. Sometimes do cards. I read out loud. I try do, you, to, do you live with somebody? I live with my wife and kids. And how, and how often do you ask them how they're doing? Uh, probably not as often as I should. Right. So I love that you had a list of what has changed for you since your stroke. I assume you had a stroke. But think about, guys, that while I am devoted to helping people achieve good communication, I'm also devoted to the care partner getting recognition, too. So I, I want you to remember that your stroke doesn't just affect you and give you a list but it affects other people. So sometime just check in, even if, even if it's, are you tired now and need to go to sleep? Even if it's, what are we going to have? Just ask a question to somebody else. I always tell my clients that have had strokes, aren't you sick of people asking you the questions? How are you? What are you doing? Did you take your medicine? Do you have an appointment? Can I do that for you? Blah, blah, blah. What about the person asking another question? a question on their own, asking another person, what can I do for you? God, are you feeling blank? So even if it's a show that you want to know if they've watched, check in with the person that pays a lot of attention to you. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. But just think about it. Oh yeah, that, that lady, Abby, she told me I should ask someone else how they're doing. And you could be, you could be Frank. So. I, I, I no realized pun intended, that. Frank. What? <laughs> I realized that they, my the stroke just didn't affect me. My wife and kids have their own stress about things, so I, I try not to worry them, and I try to do things that'll help them to feel a little bit better. Also, um. I kind of used to do things on my own and kind of not tell anybody what I was doing or act recklessly sometimes. But I I, I did try, try to keep them involved in, in everything I do. Mm -hmm. Cool. And you could do some things as a family for stress. Like I don't know how old your kids are, but one of the things I'll say is, a la like forced laughter. I don't, if your kids are young enough to to pl play with you, um, they're not young. <laughs> they're you're not my, young. It's like twenty six. My oh. daughter's like eighteen. So they could still have I, I sometimes forced laughter or a laughing circle is a very good way to just like oh my god who had such a stressful day today or I'm so stressed because my speech therapist told me I have to read this passage of the Bible out loud. How do we release stress, right? You could release stress by movement and you can release stress by laughing. It's a, and it's sometimes if you force yourself and then you like, oh my God, that's such a fake phony laugh. It actually <laughs> becomes contagious and then a little natural. You feel moronic doing it, but that feeling actually makes things funny. So if you have kids or grandkids or, or just adults, a laughing circle is a way to just sort of loosen things up and lighten the load. So. Anyway. Okay. Well, uh, I tried to keep that in mind. I mean, whether you do or not, it's fine. I got two quick things before you got to run. Um, one, I think, uh, is a, a story. Uh, um, I'll tell it as briefly as I can. It might help Brian and Frank. Um, so I have to, part of my admin duties, I have to let people into the groups. And I got uh, one woman from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I remembered it for some reason, well, because I reached out to her. A couple months later, I got another woman from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I said, oh, Stormy's in to Tulsa, I'll connect Brooke and Stormy. I do this a lot, because the concept of Stroke Buddies is originally like pairing people up, but Facebook won't let you search anything like location. Anyway... So I, I, I throw the spaghetti against the wall and sticks less than half the time, but sometimes it sticks. And in this case, it did, despite a 22-year age difference. And 
So then, so they started texting. They texted for about a year. And I accidentally, oh, then they started uh, sending each other, texting each other the difficult words that they came across during the day. And then I butt dialed Stormy by accident one time and she picked up the phone. And because I worked with a gal here named Kelly for five years who had dysarthria, she picked up the phone. Neither one of them would talk to me because they were embarrassed. And so I butt dialed Stormy. She picked it up. I could understand her. And so that changed our relationship. And then I told Brooke and neither Brooke nor Stormy can remember who called the other one. But they started, one of them called the other one, and now they practice language for half an hour, 45 minutes. Instead of uh, texting those words back and forth, they both bring their lists and they go back and forth with them. It's made a tremendous difference in, 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 in both of them. And Brooke recently had uh, uh, Botox. I never heard of this before. They injected Botox directly into her vocal cords, and it it's made a big difference so frank and brian if you don't have a a partner or you know, i think I, did brian did you say something about youtube is it you have a youtube channel or you find stuff on youtube you have to unmute yourself brian hey it finally worked and yes i do have a youtube channel well, send it to me and I'll share it with everybody I know who's got this oh, arthria. Maybe we oh, should make a disarthria group. People don't want to hear it. <laughs> you never know, Ryan. <laughs> okay, here's the deal. I tell Brooke. So Brooke says, I don't have anything to offer anybody. I say, you're five years into a hemorrhagic stroke. You're cooking. You're walking with a hemi walker now. You're conquering your disarthria. No matter where you are on this journey, you are ahead of some people and you can be an inspiration to them. People tend to look at themselves as being behind the others that they see because of this whole, you know, they want to get better thing. But Ryan, you, you, you sorry, sorry, Ralph. Okay, so you Ryan, you could you problem. could email me. I'll sing a song with you on your YouTube channel. Wow. We'll just or we could just <laughs> Let me let me give you my if anyone does have a question that you didn't want to pose or you think about it later, let me just give you my contact information and end with this little slide that okay. the whoops, <laughs> the gentle reminder is to take care of yourself, whichever way it is, whatever if it's something a doctor has told you, a therapist, some, someone that you live with, it's not selfish to take care of yourself and it's selfless to let other people know that you care about them. So if you want, you can take a picture of this, but if you, anyone wants to email me, and, yes, sir. I, was, I put this up when I post the video and I also put it under the description on YouTube um, because we appreciate what you're doing and you know you do, tell, you do telemedicine. So there might be somebody either in this group now today live or one of those 200 to 1200 people who might watch it on YouTube wants to contact you. And I'm very, I, you know, I don't really feel like, well, I'd be happy to endorse uh, any, almost anybody that I've had on the show, inclu including you. I mean, I don't really look at it as endorsements, but the way I look at it is I try and lasso people to become part of our community. And I try to um, see if I can direct some traffic towards them. And then whatever, whoever contacts you, that's between you guys and all that. And when I talk about lassoing people, Dr. Hessler is going to give us his sixth presentation next week. Well, I and I feel grateful knowing that this group will attracts people from all over the country and beyond. So it's good for you know. Again, this is all about connection. So if we could stay connected and discover ways to help each other, then that's awesome. I feel like Marilyn's on a cruise ship with those circular windows, though. <laughs> that's a mirror. That's a mirror. <laughs> yeah. One more thing, talking about connections, and then I, I, I'll let you go, and that is, we were talking about languages before. Um, there's a woman who um, you may know. She's the uh, she's a stroke survivor, and she's a program coordinator for the National Aphasia Association. Her name's uh, Doreen Mendez. She has three names, but I can only remember the two. She knew 11 languages before her stroke, and she's relearned it's an odd number, either five or seven of them. 
let's go with five. Five's <laughs> pretty impressive to have relearned five languages after dealing with aphasia. Um, if you don't know her, I'd be happy to connect the two of you. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, I know a lot of people at the NAA. Do you guys have you guys ever talked about this book, Identity Theft by Deb Meyerson? No. Okay, so this is. I'll send you this. If she's a she's a woman who had a stroke. She did does have aphasia, but she was a professor in stamp out in the West Coast. And she, you may have seen some publicity about her. She and her husband rode across the country to raise awareness about stroke and aphasia. Yeah, yeah, I, I do know her from, uh, we did a thing on with her. I did a thing last year with um, MedRooms, both for National Stroke Month and National Aphasia Month. And, and uh, they were a part of that. There were about five different organizations, Stroke Buddies being one of them that, did that. And in fact, that's how I met Doreen because for uh, National Aphasia Month, I actually contacted General Michael Hayden and got him to appear along with Tom Broussard and Doreen and a woman in uh, Rhode Island who's fascinating. I can connect you to all of them. Oh, no, it's great. She, she wasn't happy with the, she's a stroke survivor too. She wasn't happy with the whole, uh, um, with what she found for recovery. So she started her own nonprofit and she's uh, getting ready to put on her third or fourth national uh, level um, convention. I mean, they get together and meet, uh, you know, big, got to have bucks behind. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I'll connect you to all those. It can be uh, overwhelming, right? Could, I mean, it could be overwhelming to think about reading and, and connecting with so many different people like there's so much information out there and we all know that dr google could be helpful and also hindering right it, so we have to take it with a grain of salt and trust each other that what we find helpful might help someone else because clearly my little puppy thought this book was good too hmm. <laughs> Well, if you ever want to come back and talk about that or anything else would more than I would, no, if, if you if you you know i'm always a bit i don't I don't do what I do to be salesy or rich. I do what I do to be helpful and influential and try to learn from people and help people learn from themselves. And I could, I really could talk to you guys and Ralph, you in particular for a long time. I do have these other clients that I need to yeah, get yeah. to. And I need to call this wonderful organization called Medicare, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, oh, yeah. because one of my clients was told that his, I don't know, his limit had been reached. And so I'm dreading that phone call, but I'm going to approach it with a positive mindset and know that I may have to be on hold for a long time. Not necessarily, but you will. I don't, you may have made other Medicare calls, but if you don't have that person present, they won't talk to you. Well, they, they you'll will. see. All right. Um, I've done this before. I've spent three hours on the phone with Medicare, and they ask every fifteen minutes, "Is Chris still there?" And I go, "Chris." Yeah, but I'm yeah, program. I'm calling as a provider, so I have a uh, lot maybe of. Maybe it's different. Yeah. yeah, they don't regard me as a provider, I suppose. Um, well, anybody I, have yeah. any final words? It was great having you. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Yes, it was. Yes, and it was. Think about. Let me leave you with this. We're almost done with the first month of the year. I don't like to talk about New Year's resolutions. I like to encourage people to channel a, whether you admit it, whether you write it, or whether you think it one word, one word to hold like as your, as your star, as the light that like motivates you. It could be patience. It could be awareness. It could be sleep. Love. One word that just gets you through that is a year long goal and um, motivation, inspiration, okay? So thank you for having me join this wonderful group who I'm really glad to have met. And um, I hope we see each other soon or at some point later this year. Great, yes. we love it. We love it. Yes, yes, yes. All Good. right, have a great day and um, thank you again. All right. Yes, well. Thank you. It's really. lunchtime for me on the East Coast. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.